On this episode of Law Weekly, senior lawyers react to the allegations of corruption trailing the judiciary. We also have some of the highlights from the body of senior advocates of Nigeria's induction program for the new silk. The kickoff of the conversation on establishing and enforcing a scale of charges for legal services in Nigeria, plus a recap of activities from the judicial panels of inquiries and the courtrooms across the country. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shiele. The Anti-Corruption Academy of the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission startled a few people when it released its report during the week. Titled the Nigerian Corruption Index Report of a Pilot Survey, the survey covers the executive, legislature, justice and private business sectors. Based on the levels of corruption in the four sectors surveyed, the overall national score was 48. For the sectors, the justice sector had the highest level of corruption, with a score of 63. The report says that the level of corruption in the justice sector was heightened by stupendously high amounts of money offered as bribes to judges by lawyers handling high electoral and other political cases. The monetary score was put at 93. The private business sector scored 55 and ranked next to the justice sector, but it had a monetary score of 33. The executive and legislative sectors had overall corruption scores of 42 and 41, with monetary corruption of 33 and 27. 9.9% of lawyers reported the experience of paying a bribe in connection to cases, mostly electoral cases, and the amount involved was put at over 5.7 billion naira. Out of 124 judges interviewed for the pilot survey, 11 responded that they had been offered bribes to influence their handling of a case, and the total amount of money said to have been offered was put at over 3.6 billion naira. The survey also discloses that the respondents who gave these answers were mostly male, and those who had worked in the justice sector for more than 11 years constituted 49.2%. A further breakdown shows that out of the 901 justice respondents, 636 were lawyers, 124 were judges, 25 were court staff, and another 116 did not indicate their roles. We, we did a survey and spoke to a number of lawyers and judges who talked about being offered bribes, which they refused. I mean, people who accept bribes will not tell you readily that they accepted bribe, especially knowing that it could be used against them. So they refused it. But apparently some journalists in reporting this had aggregated the amounts of bribes that people were offered and suggested as if by being offered you had taken. Uh, the survey itself was to look at the effect of grand corruption. Uh, so when you are offered a huge sum of money, that indicates the stakes. And that's why we said a lot of these offers came around election petitions. And we interviewed lawyers, we interviewed judges, and many of them were responding to say, oh, yes, I, I was offered this sort of money, but of course I rejected. Okay? And the context were around election petitions, which is why the news reports carry the fact that, oh, it's not as if we were suggesting that uh, we had we knew judges who had collected 9.4 billion, and of course somebody would ask us, "What have you done about it?" So this is the outcome of a survey in which we had respondents. The respondents were judges and lawyers who had talked about offers of bribe. For lawyers, for example, they could have been offered by the litigants, okay, to say, "Please uh, let me see the judge," and the lawyers refused to do so. So aggregating the amount and suggesting that the judiciary took that is misleading in that, in that context. Meanwhile, reactions have continued to trail the report of the ICPC survey. While many declined to comment on tape on the basis that they had not read the full report, a senior advocate of Nigeria believes the root cause which needs to be addressed is the issue of appointment into office. Of course, the perception of corruption is something to worry about. This is the market that I know, is the market that I trade in. So when the market has this uh, heavy perception or heavy cloud of having been corrupted and it's pervading, of course it affects the market. It affects the traders in the market. It affects the subject of the trade. 
and it erodes the confidence in both the operators and in the system. But we often overlook the most important aspect of this thing. It's not the money. That's, that's not the most terrible aspect. The corruption is actually in how do you get people to be there. Once we get it right from that point, every other thing would pale to insignificance. Because a man who gets into an office on the basis of the gray matter between his ears, it's going to be difficult for you to influence him or her to do what is not right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Issues of corruption in the judiciary also form part of discussions at the body of Senior Advocates of Nigeria, Bolson's third annual induction program for the new Senior Advocates. The program also discussed excellence and professionalism in the practice of law, legal ethics, accountability and discipline. On the 13th of November, the Legal Practitioners Privileges Committee, at its 143rd plenary session, elevated 72 legal practitioners to the inner bar. The rank of SAN is awarded as a mark of excellence to members of the legal profession who have distinguished themselves as advocates and academics. The swearing-in ceremony for the new silks has been fixed for the 14th of December. But ahead of that ceremony, Bolson organized this program to take the new inductees lightly through the conduct expected of them after their swearing in. The first female SAN, Chief Mrs. Polake Shulanke, went down memory lane. I'm delighted to tell you that a year after I was elevated to the rank on merit, I chose the fabric the, and the colors of the silk gown that a senior advocate of Nigeria wears. The black and gold. Now, I'm constrained to acknowledge that the country and our learned profession is in the midst of serious calamities. Most regrettably, the legal profession, we should be the beacon for all that is admirable, admirable in the polity, is sadly also part of the corruption which is destroying the very fabric of the society. Our national lamentable situation is that our legal system has lost credibility. People no longer trust us or respect us. Thus, to the newly appointed SANs, I say to you and to all of us, all of us must engage in self-introspection, self-questioning, self-examination and embark on remedial action to, to restore the golden age of our learned profession when it was corruption free. That is the purpose of this induction program for you as leaders of the bar to effect a change and not to be part of the immorality that is consuming the nation. The first and only female professor of law to be conferred with the rank of SAN, Professor Oluye Misigbang Boshe, reminded the silk designates of the need to continue to contribute to advocacy through legal research. As members of the INABA in a couple of days, much has been given to you, therefore much more is being expected. And as legal practitioners who are going to be conferred with the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria in a couple of days, we are a new wine in a new scheme. Names will change. 
before we were chief ABC, it's going to be chief ABC senior advocate of Nigeria. And as Mrs. Essen said, many people will now be looking at us. And a new wine, when you become new wine in a couple of days, you cannot be put in your old bottle again. It will break. Former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Abubakar Mahmoud SAN, also stayed on the issue of corruption, integrity, and the duty of the SAN to the courts, other lawyers, clients, and the society. Now, I don't need to talk about perception of Nigeria. Uh, we all know about it. The country ranks number 148 out of 180 in corruption perception index. So that's where we are as a country. Now, I came across a recent study, baseline study on the prevalence of corruption amongst professionals and professions in Nigeria, which was carried out by an organization called Integrity with the support of MacArthur Foundation, and this was published in July 2019. The interesting thing there is the legal profession in Nigeria ranks as the most perceived corrupt amongst all professionals. Um, this study you can find online, but I, I have a copy of the, of the reports here, and it's, 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 very, it's, it's very interesting and very telling. The legal profession comes in with the 60% rank as highest perception in terms of corruption. It is followed by bankers um, who come in as, uh, sorry, I missed the slide. Yes, bankers rank of 40% 40, 40 accountants and auditors 41% building contractors 35% and medical doctors 23%. So this is the inevitable you know, statistic that we have in terms of perception of our profession. So, really, what does it mean for us as individuals, as professionals? So it's against this context, you know, you can understand some of the, I mean, the resistance or the criticisms about the rank. Why the rank of SAN? Why should it not be abolished? Why give a few persons such an advantage? Some argue it's a distortion of the market. So, um, and this debate is not unique to this country. Uh, it has happened in other places. In the UK, in, back in 2003, the award of the rank was suspended because it was seen as an unfair advantage and uh, just a kind of uh, way for government to patronize uh, lawyers. It was also seen as a market distortion. However, there was a big pushback and uh, in, 19, in 2004, there are little reforms that were introduced, and then the rank was restored along those uh, new, uh, new reforms. So, um, in Nigeria, uh, as you may have heard in the course of today, there's a strong resentment against uh, this rank by young lawyers, especially, younger members of the profession. They see uh, this just um, as a device to give create a, a small class of privileged people, give them access to market that uh, is not ordinarily available to everyone. And uh, really, um, they see it as a ticket to undeserved riches or wealth or influence. Now, so when you, when you add this to the perception of lawyers, then you can see the burden that is now thrust on you as professionals, as senior advocates that if we really have to rise up to um, defense of the legal profession, not only amongst our colleagues, but also amongst our fellow countrymen and women, then uh, the task is circular.
issue of the welfare of lawyers and attracting fair and reasonable remuneration for legal services rendered has been a major talking point in the legal community. Majority of lawyers appear to believe that fixing a comprehensive scale of charges for legal services is useful and necessary. The pros, cons, and challenges of establishing such a scale formed major talking points at the 13th annual business luncheon of the law firm of SPA Ajibade and Co. The legal profession is a highly regulated or ought to be a highly regulated profession. And we realize that dealing with the scale of fees for, for legal professionals uh, raises issues not just about their welfare, but also raises issues about their discipline, uh, raises issues about their regulation, raises issues about um, how they are perceived uh, in the marketplace. These comments by senior advocates of Nigeria, Dr. Babatunde Ajibade, set the tone for a very robust conversation on the topic. The Attorney General of the Federation believes that it is difficult to establish such a skill. He, however, gives the assurance that there is an ongoing process to look into the issues holistically. It is difficult in this current scheme of things to have a comprehensive scale in Nigeria. And because the reason for this is there are so many factors that are involved in charging professional fees. If I may, the novelty of the issue, the time and labor involved, the amount involved in the case, if it is a monetary claim based case, the location of the trial, if it involves traveling, that involved. And also in Nigeria, we operate a, 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 a capital system, a free market economy. For the president of the bar, a uniform scale of charges for lawyers practicing in different parts of the state or the country would be difficult to enforce. He says the MBA is consulting and working internally to design a workable scale. What appears to be practically feasible and enforceable, therefore, if carefully designed, is a scale of charges that imposes fee flaws, F-L-O-O-R-S, that is minimum fees that may be charged for each type of legal service in order to maintain the dignity of the profession and provide reasonable income for lawyers. Is there a possibility that some might see an attempt to fix the scale of charges for any service as anti-competitive price fixing? Here's what the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission had to say. In a manner of speaking, yes. However, the question of competition is hardly rigid per se. It is always a purpose and an effect test. Whether there is a coordinated conduct and whether the nature of the structure of the scale of fees and its operation act in a manner that substantially limits or prevents competition. And that is usually what the commission will look at. All the speakers say that for such a scale to work, it must be well thought out. I think this is part of self-regulation, which has to be very intense and very, very um, deliberate in terms that being a professional thing we're doing for ourselves, it is how much we commit ourselves to driving it that makes it work. And some recommendations for the bar and legal practitioners. I've observed that most young lawyers come out of youth service, after youth service, law school, after law school, youth service, and within two years of practice, they set up their own law firm. The question is, how much experience do they have in the business of running a law firm? How much experience do they have with engaging clients on pricing, on offering legal services? How much experience do they have? And I know that we did a bit of that in our law school, our law school courses. They tried to teach us on how to charge clients and all that. I don't think that is enough. I think we need to find a way to infuse, um, to introduce, to include the business of the law, the business of running the law. It's not bad if it comes from the university level. And on the home stretch, we bring you a recap of some of the major activities from the judicial panels probing police brutality across the country. 
We begin in Edo State where the Judicial Panel of Inquiry for Victims of SARS and Related Issues have summoned the former Divisional Police Officer of Iroa Police Division, simply identified as Mr. Asaibo. The panel summoned him to appear before it and provide answers to certain allegations made against him in a petition filed by members of the Udoje of Fangba family in Usenu, Iroa, Esan, central local government area of Edo State. The family wants the panel to help it get justice for the alleged killing of two members of the family by the police sometime in 1999. In Taraba State, the absence of the police stalled the sitting of the Judicial Panel of Inquiry for Victims of Police Brutality. At the first public hearing in Jalingo, the state capital, three petitions were mentioned for hearing with their legal representatives present, but the police as defendants to the suit were absent. While considering the submission of the council to the petitioners and mindful of the absence of respondents and their representatives, chairman of the panel adjourned the hearing in the interest of justice. And in Lagos, the chairman of the judicial panel, Justice Doris Okwobi, has reiterated that the panel will not continue to allow the police waste time by stalling on calling its witnesses, especially the officers alleged to have been involved in the various cases of abuses before it. Justice Okwobi made this declaration after the counsel to the police, Emmanuel Eze and Joseph Ebosareme, again sought short adjournment in the first two petitions heard by the panel on Tuesday. The police counsel, in their explanations to the panel, said with the disbandment of SARS, it had become difficult to get the police officers accused of committing the alleged human rights abuses against the petitioners. They also explained that some were out of the court's jurisdiction and they needed to follow due process with securing their release from their present postings. Justice Okwobi was not impressed with the explanations. She said that the Lagos panel had received over 200 petitions and had not delivered a single judgment. It could therefore not continue to move at snail speed, occasioned by the delay of the police in calling its witnesses. In the interest of justice, however, the panel has directed its registry to ensure that at least 50 of the petitions received are served on the police council to enable it to use the period of the Christmas holidays to search for the officers mentioned by victims of SARS-related abuses. The Nigeria police has appealed to withdraw a suit filed against the judicial panels of inquiry set up to probe allegations of brutality and human rights abuses against the force. The suit was withdrawn via a notice of discontinuance filed by a police counsel, Festus Ibude. The police in filing the suit had initially argued that establishment of panels of inquiry by state governors to investigate activities of the force was illegal and unconstitutional. But then the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, in a statement signed by the Force Public Relations Officer, however expressed his disapproval of the suit and said he had queried the officer involved. At the courts, the Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, and the Human and Environmental Development Agenda Resource Center have been granted leave to sue the Central Bank of Nigeria for failing to disclose detailed information on COVID donations requested from it in July this year. Justice Inyang Ekwo of the Federal High Court Abuja granted the order following an ex-party application moved by the two applicants. The judge also ordered the applicants to file the substantive suits within seven days, serve same on the CBN within seven days after the filing and directed the CBN to file its response to the suit within 30 days of being served by the applicants. Another Federal High Court in Abuja has fixed February the 5th, 2021 for hearing in the suit filed by six civil society organizations challenging the exclusion and alleged marginalization of women in the administration of President Muhammad Buhari. The suit is filed by the Incorporated Trustees of Nigeria Women Trust Fund, Women Empowerment Legal Aid, Center for Democracy and Development West Africa, Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center, Vision Spring Initiative and Women in Politics Forum against the federal government and the Attorney General of the Federation. The plaintiffs are asking the court to determine whether the refusal of the first defendant to implement the 35% affirmative action policy of the federal government of Nigeria is not unlawful and an arbitrary violation of the National Gender Policy 2006 and Article 19 of the African Charter of Human and People's Rights. And we round off with a report that Justice Okon Abang has ordered the remand of former chairman of the defunct pension reform task team, Abdul Rashid Maina, in prison custody until the end of his trial. The order for Miner's remand came 24 hours after his trial on a 12-count money laundering charge commenced at the High Court. Miner was arrested in Niamey, Niger Republic and extradited to Nigeria by the Interpol. The former pension reform boss jumped bail in September 29 this year and refused to appear for his trial. And it's on this note that we are joined till next week. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget that you can catch this episode and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. 
I am Shola Shueli. See you next week.